Hi everyone, <coughs> welcome to Information Economics. So uh, this will be our starting point for using videos to teach you basic ideas about um, the course materials. Today I want to talk about game theory. Okay, Some of you may have learned game theory in the past, but here I will assume that you have no uh, related knowledge. And I will um, start from the very basic ideas. Anyway, we will focus only on those parts that are related to this course. So, uh, it will be a very brief introduction. If you want to give yourself a more uh, rigorous or comprehensive um, training about game theory, the, the reference I provided in the syllabus will be helpful. Okay, anyway, let's start. So, <coughs> what we want to do today is to introduce games under complete information. So our first assumption during today's lecture is that all the information that are relevant to the environment of our players are publicly known. We say that these information are common knowledge. Okay. So that means there is no information asymmetry in today's lecture, in the games we want to discuss. So this allows us to focus on the interaction and the behaviors of those players. If we have information asymmetry, if some players know something that the other players does not know, then modeling them and solving for the game will become harder. So naturally we start our introduction with games under complete information, okay? And then after two or three weeks, we will move to games with incomplete information. Today we will talk about static and dynamic games. For static games, that means there is only one period. All the players choose their actions simultaneously during that particular period or time point, okay? So that's static game. Another type of game is dynamic game. In a dynamic game, players act uh, sequentially. Okay, this is players. Okay, sorry. So, <coughs> these players will be involved in a game <coughs> that has multiple periods. <coughs> and then player 1 makes the decision first and then player 2, and then probably player 3, or it go back to player 1. We will see the timing time setting when we describe the game. Our focus is not just about mathematics. Okay, We will mathematically formulate games, and then we want to use those solutions to illustrate the inefficiency caused by decentralization. Basically, what we want to do is to show you that if they can cooperate, they can do better, or whether they can do better. Okay, And we would like to highlight what's the impact of decentralization, how large is it. Okay, We want to somehow describe and quantify the negative impact of decentralization. We're going to go to details later. We will start by solving, uh, by formulate a game, and then to solve it. By solving that, we're going to predict what people will do in equilibrium. Okay, this is how we may start to use game theoretic models to study problems in economics or business. Okay, this is our approach, and I will try to demonstrate how may we do that. So. In, the, in this first video, I will start from the very basic example about prisoner's dilemma to open our discussions. The story is the following. There are two guys, A and B. These two persons, they broke into a grocery store and stole some money. Before the police officers caught them, they have hided those money and the, the officers cannot find those money. So there is no evidence to show that they have stolen the money. However, there are some images caught by monitor that showing that they have broken the window. Okay, so there is an evidence showing that uh, they have this amount 
of um, bad things. They did these bad things, but for money, there is no evidence. And then these two guys were kept into two separated rooms. Each of them were then asked individually about two offers, denial or confession. It says、uh, the police officer would say to one of them and say, "Hey, do you want to confess? So that、uh, do you want to confess about you have stolen the money and tell us where is the money? Okay, if you do so, then something may happen, or you may choose to deny, and some other things will happen. Let's see what are the con-、uh, results of that." Suppose both of them choose not to tell the truth. If both of them deny, and then they will both get one month in prison. Okay, that's because they, it's it's up it's evident that they have broken the window, so they must be put in jail for one month. But because there's no evidence for, for the the stolen money, so they just cannot be. Put in jail for longer. However, if one confesses while the other denies, then the former will provide evidence to the police, and then the latter will get nine months in prison. Okay. At the same time, the former will be set free because he cooperates with the police officers. Finally, if both of them confesses, then both of them will get six months in prison. Okay, here six is lower than nine. Is because in the second case, I deny, but my friend confess. So that means they even have evidence showing that I am lying to the police officers. So that's why I need to be put in jail for nine months. Okay, so these are the offers. When the two guys are making their decisions, they cannot communicate with each other. So that means they must make their decisions at the same time. Okay, it's not possible for one to make the decision and tell the other guy, and then ask the other guy to make the decision. They must make decisions together.、Uh, I mean, at the same time. So they act, or they what they want, of course, is to be put in jail as short as possible. Now we have the full story. We want to know what will they do. Okay, we will formulate a game and solve it. In this case, we have two players in this game. Okay, there are two guys to make decisions. So we also say that they are decision makers. Each of them have two options or two possible actions. Player one may choose to deny or confess. And player two may choose to deny or confess. If both of them deny, they will be put in jail for one month, both. Okay, so their utility are negative one. If one deny and the other confesses, then the one, the first one, will get in jail for nine months, but the second one will be set free. Or if they confess together. They will both be put in jail for six months. Okay, so these numbers or inside entries marks the utilities of that particular outcome of choices. Okay, the first number is for the first player, and the second number is for the second player. So this is the formulation of the game. Let's try to see how may we solve it. The idea is very simple. For player one. I will think about the following.、Um, I will think in the following way.、Uh, suppose I am player two. If player two chooses deny, what should I do? Okay. Then in that case, I should compare the result of deny, denial, and the result of confession. And then, I will naturally choose confession. Right, because zero is greater than negative one. I prefer to be set free directly. Or if player two chooses confession, then I would need to compare negative nine and negative six, and then I would see oh six is smaller than nine. That's greater. So 
immediately I make a conclusion. In either case, I prefer confession, right? So confession is a dominant strategy in this case because it definitely dominates denial. No matter what the other guy do, I should confess. Okay? So for player two, it's the same thing. And then we can show directly that both of them will choose confession. Okay? Because for both of them, confession is a dominant strategy. So we can predict the result. The result is that both of them will choose confession and be put in jail for six months. Okay? We call this the solution of this game. And then before we move to the next slide, look at this matrix again. This is actually not very good, right? Or we can say this is actually the worst outcome for them because together they were put in jail for 12 months. If, for example, they can coordinate and together say denial, they can be put in jail for two months only. Then that's definitely better. Or we say for this system it's more efficient because people's, people involved in this game become happier. Okay, so that means they are doing something inefficient. That's not because they are not smart. Actually, they are smart. They have calculated the game, think about the game, and find what's optimal to them. But because they do this individually, not together, not jointly, so eventually the result is just bad. Okay? This is one of the heart of game theory or game theoretic analysis. If it is possible for these guys to cooperate, they may do better. However, because now they are making decisions individually and selfishly, so actually they are doing worse. So as some uh, summary, in this game, confession is said to be a dominant strategy. Okay? The outcome can be improved if they can cooperate, but unfortunately here they do not. So we say that's a lose-lose situation. If they can cooperate, we will get win-win. Okay? We say this is socially inefficient because this is not the best they may get if they cooperate. Okay, so we will see more situations like the prisoner's dilemma very soon, for example, in today's lecture. But at this moment, keep in mind that there are some situations, there are multiple players in a game. They make decisions to affect each other. And while they are working hard to make themselves better off, the fact that they are working hard actually hurts them. Okay? The fact that they are selfish actually were, uh, hurts them. Okay. Uh, personal Dilemma is good, but there are some other games that actually have no dominant strategy. Let's look at the first game here. Suppose I have two players and they are each have two decisions. The payoffs are here. Is it possible to find any dominant strategy here? No. Okay. If player 2 choose B, then player 1 prefers uh, B. But if player 2 choose S, player 1 would prefer S. So there is no dominant strategy. Or for the other game, if player one choose head, player one uh, sorry, if player two choose head, player one would also choose head. But if player two choose tail, player one would prefer tail. For player two, you may also do the analysis and see there is no dominant strategy. So if we want to solve these games or to predict the outcome of these games, then we need another solution concept. We need another way to define solutions. That's going to be Nash equilibrium to be explained in the next video. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to go over the concept of Nash equilibrium. In general, this will be the, 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 the guideline for us to solve static games. Okay, 
or roughly speaking, for any static game, we want to find its Nash equilibrium. So let's try to do this. So first, uh, we need to give you a precise definition of Nash equilibrium. So suppose there is a game with n players, okay? There can be any number of players. For each player, there must be an action space. Let's call it SI. SI contains all those possible actions of player I. And each player should have a utility function UI. UI is a function of actions. Okay, so whenever we have a, an action profile, which is a collection of actions, let's call it S1 up to SN, then we have a utility function, a utility can be decided by putting those actions into the utility function. Okay. So, uh, generally speaking, that means my utility depends on other players' utilities. Maybe some of them, but anyway, in general, it can depend on all the players' uh, action. Okay? So, my payoff is affected by other guys. Now, for a Nash equilibrium to happen, we require the following thing. That is... Suppose a profile is a Nash equilibrium, then that means if all other players do not change their action, okay, if they are still sticking into S1 star up to S N star, if all other guys do not deviate, then I will also not deviate, okay. Originally, I am choosing SI star. And then, because SI star is uh, the utility for me to t take SI star is greater than or equal to any other SI. Okay? So that means if others do not deviate, then I do not deviate. If that's true for all the players, then it is a Nash equilibrium. Okay? So, Another way to write it down is the following. For all the players, if the player try to solve the optimization problem for selecting an action, then given those other guys' actions, my action would be that in the, utility, uh, in the Nash equilibrium. Okay? So... Either this or that. That's the mathematical definition of Nash equilibrium. But anyway, the intuition is, if we say an action profile is a Nash equilibrium, then no player has an incentive to unilaterally deviate. This term is just means to deviate when no other guys deviate. Okay, we will see examples. Here you see a term pure strategy. We'll talk about it later. So, let's consider this example. Here we have two players, each has three actions. So, player 1 choose T, M, or B. Player 2 choose left, center, or right. There are nine, in total, nine action profiles. Okay? T, L, T, C, T, R, ba ba ba, up to B, R. Is there any Nash equilibrium? Let's try to see it. For TL, okay, they get 0 and 4. In this case, this is not a Nash equilibrium because player 1 has the incentive to move to M. Here, this is unilaterally deviation, okay? Player 1 would think, okay, currently we are at TL. If player 2 does not deviate, then I would move to M because 4, 0 gives me a higher utility than 0, 4. The same thing happens to TC. Okay? If currently they are at TC, player 2 would think, okay, if player 1 sticks to T, I would like to move to either R or L, because 4 is greater than 0, 3 is greater than 0. Okay, so this is also not a Nash equilibrium. You may go through all these action profiles until you see BR. 
Br is a Nash equilibrium because if player two stays at R, I have no incentive to move to three. Uh, sorry, to C. Uh, sorry, <coughs> if player two stays at R, I have no incentive to move to M or T because six is greater than five and five. So player two is the same thing. Okay, so. We can show that there is only one Nash equilibrium in this game. Sometimes we say a Nash equilibrium is an outcome of this game. That means we predict this guy is going to do this decision. Of course, that's based on an assumption that they interact for many, many uh, iterations. Or we say they do that in their brain for many, many times. Okay, think very deeply before they make the final action. But at least we can say a Nash equilibrium is a stable outcome. Because once that happens, unless they coordinate, then no one is going to change their decision. Let's see some more example. For the prisoner's dilemma, we may again, for each of the action profile, to verify whether it is an uh, sorry, whether it is a Nash equilibrium. This one is not, because player 1 has the incentive to unilaterally deviate. 0 is greater than negative 1. For denial and confession, it's again not, because player 2 has the incentive, uh, sorry, player, uh, yeah, player, uh, player 1 has the incentive to move to confession, because 6 is greater than, uh, I mean, negative 6 is greater than negative 9. This is the same. And then we can see confession and confession is a Nash equilibrium. Player 1 does not want to move to denial because that's going to get him only negative 9. Player 2 does not want to move to denial because he does not want to get negative 9. Similarly, we may investigate the other game we mentioned in the previous video. Here, how about BB? BB is a Nash equilibrium, okay? Because 2 and 1 are greater than 0 and 0. And then SS is a Nash equilibrium, but BS or SB are not, okay? So this means this game has two Nash equilibria. For the last game, we can do some investigation and immediately you will see there is no Nash equilibrium. So, we got three examples. A unique Nash equilibrium, multiple Nash equilibria, or no Nash equilibrium. All are possible. Actually, the previous slides is not rigorous enough because we only talk about pure strategy Nash equilibrium. But if we allow randomized or mixed strategy, things will be different. Okay, what's this? Let's look at this game again. Uh, actually, this is uh, just a simplified version of Caesar Paper Stone, right? Because in either situation, one wins or one loses. If we look at this game, actually, there is one strategy. That strategy is to randomly choose head or tail, right? There's no one saying that you must make your decision about choosing head 100% or to choose tail for 100%. You can say that you want to choose a decision variable P, okay, P, which is the probability for you to choose head. And then naturally 1 minus p yours is your probability for choosing t the other player can choose q and 1 minus q as his probability for choosing head and tail and then this game is going to become two decision um, problems player one solves for p and player two solves for q for the optimal stretch or the optimal probability to choose head. Anyway, what my, uh, my point here is just that if we allow randomized strategy, then the strategy space will be much larger than when we only allow pure strategy, right? Even if we only have two actions, the strategy space 
is actually infinite because we have a whole line segment. Okay, you can choose P to be 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2.6, uh, sorry, 0 0.26 or 0 0.3114. No, that's all possible. So, under this assumption, in 1950, John Nash proved the following theorem regarding the existence of mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Given any static game, if the number of players is finite and the action space are all finite, then there must be at least one mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. This proposition is very important because it shows that for a wide class of games, for static games, we can find at least one mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. And then that's going to help us applying this concept, right? Because if the concept is so strict, is so strict that for many games we don't have a Nash equilibrium, then it's not very useful. But because we have this proposition, then the whole field of game theory start to build things upon this concept. So this is one of the most important findings in economics in the past uh, 60 or 70 years. Okay. Actually, in this course, we will try ourselves to avoid mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Most of the time, we will only focus on cases where we have pure strategy Nash equilibrium. This is because we are really facing business applications, right? If we are making decisions, somehow we need to make a choice. Somehow we need to make a choice. You cannot say to your supplier that, uh, with probability one half, tomorrow give me 100 units. Or with probability one half, tomorrow give me 200 units. You cannot make this kind of random order to your suppliers. You somehow need to make a decision. So in most of the applications we study in this course, we only focus on pure strategy Nash equilibria. But still, I hope you to know there are pure strategy games, uh, sorry, pure strategy Nash equilibrium, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, and the foundations there. Okay, let's stop here. Thank you. Okay, so now we have the knowledge about Nash equilibrium. Now let's apply Nash equilibrium to solve a game that is has some business uh, implications. This is a game called Cornered Competition. Okay? It's a classic example about game theory. Let's try to do it. So in uh, 1838, the French economics um, corner, yeah, it introduced the following quantity competition between two retailers. So let's see the story. For each retailer or for each firm, they choose a production quantity, QI, and that's going to be the decision variable of each quantity uh, of each firm. And then the market clearing price for the total product for all the products will be the function of Q. Capital Q is Q1 plus Q2. And the formula is A minus Q. What does that mean? If there are more, uh, um, yeah. If there are more items on the market, then they will be of less value. Okay. So, if the two firms choose to produce more, then the market clearing price will become smaller. Okay. Actually, you immediately see this is something related to your homework one, right? In homework one, you have one company making the production decision and now we have two uh, two companies the unit production cost again is still C and each firm wants to maximize its own profit here we post several questions that we want to ask for this particular problem first what will these two firms do we want to predict the outcome or we want to solve the game and then we want to ask whether this is outcome is satisfactory or whether it is efficient. And then we want to ask what is the difference between duopoly and the monopoly. We probably want to uh, compare the outcome in your homework one and log outcome here so that we may highlight uh, is there any efficiency loss 
for having duopoly? Or is there anything good or bad with decentralization? So let's try to formulate and solve the game. There are two players. Each of them has an action space which is from zero to infinity. That's a quantity to be chosen as the production quantity. Okay, that's a single number. And then they have their utility functions. For player one, it depends on Q1 and Q2, right? It first depends on the production quantity, and then it depends on the margin. So A minus Q1 plus Q2 is the price of the product, and then minus C gives you the margin. So Q1 times this is going to be the total profit earned by firm 1. Similarly, we have this for firm 2. The price is the same, but the quantity becomes Q2. And then, we, once we have defined players, action spaces, and utility functions, we have defined or we have uh, formulated a game. Now let's solve it. Suppose Q1 star and Q2 star is a Nash equilibrium. Okay, then that Nash equilibrium must satisfy the, the, the condition that no one wants to unilaterally deviate. So how may we do that? Q1 star must be optimal for player 1 if player 2 chooses Q2 star. So let's say Q2 star has been fixed. Okay, the player 2 does not deviate, so player 2 fixes, uh, player 2 is fixed to Q2 star. And then, player 1 solves the game for choosing Q1, and the Q1 star must be optimal for it. Similarly, if player 1 sticks to Q1 star, then player 2 must choose Q2 star. Okay, so uh, in general, we have numbers. For example, uh, we may say A is 100, C is 10, something like that. And then we, we ask, um, is 10, 20 a Nash equilibrium? Then we plug in numbers here, okay? This is 100. This is, uh, let's write it down. This is 100. This is 20. This is 10. Okay, I am trying to ask whether 10 and 20 is a Nash equilibrium. And then the player 1's problem will become to maximize Q1 times, okay, here you can see it becomes 100 minus 20 minus 10, becomes 70 minus Q1, okay. If player 2 chooses 20, player 1 should solve this problem to see how much should it orders, okay. And then you may ver verify whether player 1 will choose 10 or not. It's clear it will not. Okay? This is a problem that we know how to solve, right? First order condition, second order condition, whether it is convex or concave, whether a first order condition point satisfies the constraint or not. We can see 10 is not the best response to 20. So player 1 will try to unilaterally deviate. So 10 and 20 is not a Nash equilibrium. Okay, but we don't want to investigate all the points, so let's try to then let's see how to do this. For player one, we see that the objective function is actually having only one variable, it's just Q1, right? Because Q2 star is assumed to be a constant. So we probably first should show that it is concave or strictly concave. We do a first order derivative, we do a second order derivative. This is negative, so it is indeed strictly concave. When we are dealing with player 1's problem, Q2 star is a constant, okay? So treat it as a constant. So the first order condition requires player 1 to order according to this formula, or to produce according to this formula. Whatever Q2 star is, to order A minus Q2 star minus C over 2. This is the player 1's optimal way to respond to player 2's quantity. Okay, this e equation must be satisfied for player 1. So let's review 
what we mentioned about our previous example. Suppose A is 100, Q2 is 20, C is 10. Then we can see that the number should be 35. And that means 10 is not optimal. And then 10, 20 is not a Nash equilibrium. There's one thing that we need to know. Uh, when we have this, we have a question whether this is positive or not. Okay? So if Q2 star is less than A minus C, then Q1 star is going to be optimal because it can satisfy the non-negativity constraint. But at this moment, we cannot verify it because we haven't got any condition for Q2. So let's move to firm 2's problem. But firm 2's problem is just symmetric to firm 1's problem, right? So we have this immediately uh, through the same process. So now we can say if Q1 star and Q2 star is a Nash equilibrium such that we have this condition, then this pair of quantities must satisfy these two things, okay, these two equations. In the previous slides, they belong to the two optimal, optimal sets. In the previous slides, we say these two quantities must belong to the set of optimal solutions. And then, using our knowledge, we can say it's actually the two equations to be satisfied. We solve these two equations, okay, it's 2 by 2, and then we can see our Q1 star and Q2 star should be A minus C over 3. Before we do anything, is this make, does this make sense? Uh, when A becomes larger, they, order more, they produce more, reasonable. When C becomes larger, they produce less, reasonable. So, at least, intuitively, there is nothing wrong. And then, because this satisfies the condition we need, this is indeed a Nash equilibrium. In some sense, we can show that this is the only point, the only profile that satisfies the two first-order conditions. So, it is the only optimal, uh, sorry, it is the only Nash equilibrium, right? Because no other point can satisfy these two equations at the same time. So this is the unique optimal solution, uh, the unique Nash equilibrium. Okay, so now we can do some more analysis. First, what is the price or the cost of decentralization? Suppose the two firms are integrated together. Then together they would choose a quantity a total quantity to produce. So they, it seems that they merge to a single firm and then solve this question. This is just your problem in homework 1, right? So the result is A minus C over 2. And then our first observation is that when these two firms decentralize their decisions, when these two firms do not collaborate, the total quantity becomes larger, okay? Or say it in another way, if the two firms cooperate, they should each produce A minus C over 4, so that together they get A minus C over 2. If they cooperate, they should produce A minus C over 2. But when they do not cooperate, uh, sorry, when they cooperate, they should produce A minus C over 4. But when they do not, they produce more. They produce A minus C over 3. So why does a firm try to increase its production quantity under decentralization? It's because that when I increase my quantity, I got benefit and loss, right? The, the function is that, um, oh, sorry, my, the function is Q1. Let's say I am firm 1. Q1 times A minus Q1 minus Q2 minus C. If I try to increase my quantity, then I get benefit because I can sell more. But the loss is that the price will become smaller. The interesting thing here is that the benefit is, sh is owned by myself, but the cost is shared for both firms. Okay? So you are at a situation that you may make a decision. There are benefits, there are loss. 
but the loss will be shared by everyone in your team, but the benefit is your own. Then naturally you become a something like a free rider, and if you are only caring about yourself. You have some intention to increase your production quantity a little bit. That's why we see this. Okay, our result confirms this intuition regarding free riders, and we can show you that indeed, when they do decentralization, no one will stay at a minus c over four. They will increase their production quantity, and then we may try to quantify. The loss of efficiency. So, if the firms try to integrate, what's going to happen?、Um, that's our question. So, under integration, the total quantity is a minus c over two. Okay, and then this is the price. All together, they get this amount as a total profit. If they decentralize, then this is the quantity, right? The price will become A minus C over three, because the total quantity becomes larger. So each firm is going to earn this amount, and then here we have two firms, right? So the total profit is、uh, A minus C square times two divided by nine, which is smaller than the integrated profit. So we can say that pi C is greater than pi D one plus pi D two. So we say the integrated system is really more efficient because together, they earn more money, right? Together the two firms earn more money. If they can cooperate, and then do appropriate profit splitting, then both firm can earn more if they co-、uh, cooperate or collaborate, right? If they decentralize, each of them earn less. If they together and if they do things together, they earn this together, and then they share. For example, half half, then each one can be better off. So we say in this case, integration is a win win strategy. Okay. However, under monopoly, the aggregate aggregate quantity is lower, and the price is higher, right? On the aggregate quantity, this one is lower, and the price is higher. So that means. Consumers, from consumers' perspective, consumers prefer the firms to decentralize. Okay, consumers prefers the firms to decentralize. Why? Naturally, consumers prefer competition. If the firms compete with each other, consumers will be happy, because the total supply becomes larger, and the price becomes smaller, which is intuitive, and we observe that in our daily life. Right. That's why we have antitrust law to prevent、uh, some kind of monopolies. So the firms prefer monopoly. The firms prefer integration, but consumers does not. Finally, we can say that the firms are actually in a prisoner's dilemma. Why? Let's say we suggest them to produce a minus c over four to each of them. Okay, because they cannot cooperate. If they do not cooperate, let's assume we make this or a suggestion to them. This is actually to maximize their profit. Because with a minus c over four, each of them is going to earn a minus c square over eight, greater than the equilibrium outcome. But unfortunately, this is not a Nash equilibrium. If the other guy chooses a minus c over four. Okay. Then, according to my best response equation, I will not choose a minus c over four. I will choose to increase my quantity. Right?、Uh, we have the incentive to increase my quantity. So in this case, both firms will have incentives to unilaterally deviate. So this firm, these two firms, are really engaged in a prisoner's dilemma. Okay. You may try to convince yourself. To say that okay,、uh, we have an option is a minus c over four, another option is a minus c over three, and so on here. And then, the best thing to do is for them to cooperate and choose a minus c over four together. However, each of them, selfishly, individually, 
make their own decision and find this is better. Okay, so that's a prisoner's dilemma. So this is how we analytically solve this two-player game. We find the Nash equilibrium. According to that, we can do some comparisons with the integrated case. We can do some analysis to show that this is actually a prisoner's dilemma. This is our introduction of um, static games. In the lecture, we will give you more examples so that you may understand static games more. In the next video, we will talk about dynamic games. Thank you. Okay, so now let's move to an introduction about dynamic games. Okay, as we mentioned, this means players make decisions uh, one by one. So we will mainly focus on the solution process for dynamic games, which is called backward induction. We're going to tell you how to use backward induction to solve dynamic games. Let's recall a game about choosing B or S, B or S. We mentioned to you that there are two Nash equilibria in this game when they play this game uh, statically. However, if they make decisions sequentially rather than simultaneously, will things be different? Well, let's try to analyze it. So we want to know what will they do in equilibrium. How will their payoffs change? And is there any difference to become the leader or the follower? So now we need to specify the timing for this game. Let's assume player 1 makes the decision first. And then player 2 makes her decision or his decision. Now, instead of a matrix, we probably should use a tree to describe this game. Okay? The first node or the, the, the root labels as, is labeled as 1. That means player 1 is to choose between B or S. And then at an internal node here, like here, player 2 observed that player 1 chose um, B and then player 2 makes the decision about B or S. Okay. One important fact here is that when player 2 makes the decision, player 2 has observed player 1's decision. Okay. And then player 2 makes the decision. So what's really important is not the time for them to make decisions. It's about whether they know the other one's decision. Okay? It is possible that we play a game that player 1 makes the decision today. Player 2 makes the decision tomorrow. But they don't know whether the other one has made the decision. If that's the case, then it's actually a static game. Okay? What's important is whether you know the other one has made the decision or whether you know the other one's decision. Here we assume player 2 observes player 1's decision. Okay, and then after both of them have chosen a decision, the outcome will be realized. In this case, player 1 gets 2, player 2 gets 1, or in this case, they get 0 and 0, and so on and so on. So the game is played from the root to leaves. If they choose B and S, then get 0, 0. That's the idea. So, uh, now we want to find their optimal strategies. So, we ask, how should player 1 move? If you are player 1, the thing you want to do is to predict how player 2 will respond to your decision. Right? Because you are the leader of this game. So, once you make your decision, player 2 sees it and then player 2 will optimally respond to your decision. So we first treat ourselves as player 2, and then try to see what should player 2 do. So if player 2 is here, okay, if player 2 has observed that player 1 chose B, player 2 will also choose B, right? because 1 is greater than 0. But if player 2 has observed S, Player 2 will choose S, right? Because 2 is greater than 0. So now we can see B for B or S for S is player 2's best response. Okay, just like in a static game. In a dynamic game, we may also find a player's best response 
to the other players. Now player one can make her decision, right? If player one choose B, eventually player one will get two. If player one choose S, eventually he will get one. So player one will choose B, of course, because two is greater than one. All right. So now we have solved this game. Because we can say that an equilibrium outcome is a path goes from the root to a leaf. So in equilibrium, these two guys will play BB as their equilibrium. Okay, that's the idea. So let's make some comparisons. When they play this game, um, in a, when they play the game simultaneously, there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria. But when we choose player one to be the leader, and then they play this game dynamically, we will only get one equilibrium outcome, BB. Okay, mm, this is not very surprising because the game rule has been changed, so the outcome has been changed. That's possible, right? So their equilibrium behaviors change. Okay, in general, this is not always the case. You may find a game such that. No matter it is static or dynamic, the result is the same. Okay, so changing the game rule does not require to change the outcome. Also, here, being the leader is a good thing, right? Because now you may verify, player one gets two, but player two only gets one. So being the leader is beneficial. Is it always the case? Well, let's see the other example. Consider the 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 game H and T, okay, and here, let's solve this game. Previously, there is no Nash equilibrium, but now, when player two is making her decision, one is better than negative one, so player two will choose T. And then, if player two observe T, he will choose H, right? Because one is greater than negative one. So then, player one will think, um, if I choose H. I get negative 1. If I choose T, uh, I also get negative 1. So in this case, player 1 feels that it doesn't matter. So in this case, we have two possible equilibrium outcomes, HT or TH. There are two possible outcomes. And then being the leader is actually hurt. Uh, it's actually a bad thing, right? Just like when you play a uh, scissor, paper, stone. If you are the leader, then you are going to be lost, be lose, be losing the game. So this example tells us it's not always the good thing to be a leader. Okay, this happens in all kinds of dynamic games. So let's make a conclusion. In the previous two examples, there is a leader and there is a follower. Before the leader really makes her decision. The leader should anticipate what the follower will do, right? This is how the leader makes the decision. So, in this case, we can solve this game by first making analysis on the second stage. In general, if there are multiple stages, we should try to analyze those problems from the last stage. We solve the last stage problem, and then we can take that as the input to solve the second last stage, and so on and so on. In general, we move backwards until the first stage problem is solved, and then we try to find an equilibrium path from the root to a leaf node, okay? So that we may characterize what they will do in equilibrium. This solution concept is called backward induction, and that's going to be the main weapon the main strategy we use to solve dynamic games. Thank you. Okay, so this is our last video for today's lecture. Now we know how to use backward induction to solve dynamic games. Let's apply it to a pricing problem in a supply chain. Consider a supply chain with a manufacturer and a retailer. The manufacturer makes the product and sells it to the retailer and then the retailer sells to the market. <coughs> the unit production cost of making a product is C, 
The wholesale price chosen by the manufacturer is EW, and the retailer sells to the market at a retail price R. Given that, the demand will be A minus B R, where A and B are just constants. Okay? In this game, the manufacturer chooses the wholesale price, and then the retailer chooses the retail price. So this is a dynamic game because the manufacturer is the leader, and then the reader is the follower. Okay, so now, after this, each of them will maximize their profit. Okay, that's how they make their decisions. They will choose their prices individually to maximize its own profit. So, let's try to formulate and solve this game. Let's focus on the retailer side first. Uh, for, to make the derivation easier, let's assume A and B are 1, and C is 0 for a while. So D becomes this, and there is no cost at all. Suppose we are looking at the retailer. Given the wholesale price, okay, the wholesale price has been announced and fixed. Given the wholesale price, the retailer's problem is this one. R minus W is the margin, and 1 minus R is the resulting quantity. With this, immediately we can solve for the optimal solution here. W plus 1 over 2 is the retailer's best response to any wholesale price. Okay, This is definitely a function of the wholesale price, and we can see some intuitive results. When the wholesale price becomes larger, what's going to happen to the retail price? The retail price will also become larger. Okay? If the wholesale price becomes one unit larger, the retail price is going to become one half unit um, larger. So th this creates two meanings. First, if your supplier gives charges you more, then you have the pressure and you must also make your price higher so that you can get the maximized profit okay so that's something also quantitatively <coughs> we observe that for every single dollar increase in the wholesale price the retailer only increase one half dollar in the retail price that means when the manufacturer increases the margin the retailer will decrease its margin okay he does not want to do that but he has no choices because that's the way that's the only way to compensate the manufacturer's margin increase because the increased margin is going to decrease decrease the, pro uh, the, 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 the demand the retailer must make sure that the demand is still okay so the retailer must decrease its margin anyway Intuitively, this solution looks fine, so let's continue. Now we have this prediction in mind. The retailer knows once W is chosen, the retail price will be this one. So now, the manufacturer can also calculate the order quantity or the sales quantity to the retailer because 1 minus R is going to be 1 minus W over 2. Okay. Naturally, when the manufacturer increases the wholesale price, the total demand will become smaller. This is not because the, retail, the, the customers can see W directly, right? The consumers just don't care about the wholesale price. It's that this is an indirect effect. When I increase my wholesale price, the retailer is going to also increase his retail price. That's why the demand becomes smaller. Anyway, now we have the wholesale price minus zero as the margin. And then this is the sales quantity. The manufacturer solves this problem and get one half as his optimal solution. Okay, something that we can do. Here, I want to say more about it. The first thing that we want to compare is about um, the two prices. The wholesale price is one half and the retail price is three over four. 
This is a common practice called markup. The, manuf- the retailer is going to add a positive margin to the wholesale price, naturally, because the retailer wants to make money. Okay, so the price can only go up when you have more layers in your supply chain, and then the sales volume, the retailer's manufacturer's profit can all be calculated according to the formula or the model we use. In total, we can see the retailer can earn one over sixteen, the manufacturer earns one more or one over eight, and together they earn three over sixteen. Okay, this can be done. When we assume the 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 the, the, the parameters are one one and zero, we get something like this. Okay, easy. But if we try to use the original model with A, B, and C, probably we can still solve it, right? And then we will have these um equilibrium profits, equilibrium prices, as functions of our parameters. And then we can do comparative statics to show how those parameters change will affect our equilibrium outcome. Let's try this. So in general, the retailer's problem is to solve this. The demand function in general is a minus b r. Okay. Through some arithmetics, we can show that the optimal solution is b w plus a over two b. Okay. Uh. Just a reminder: If you forgot how to solve it, first order condition. Okay. Now we have this. Probably you want to do some intuitive test. Okay, what's going to happen when A goes up? What's going to happen when B goes up? You actually have done so in first first week's lecture. And then the manufacturer predicts the result. So given the wholesale price, this will be the retail price. So given the wholesale price, I know what will be the retail price. Okay, nothing special. The manufacturer problem is so formulated like this, and then the optimal wholesale price is this one. Let's do some investigations. When A goes up, wholesale price goes up. Good. When C goes up, the wholesale price goes up. Good, because the cost becomes higher. When B goes up, you may want to do a verification. You can see that. The price is going to go down, right? Because if consumers are more sensitive, I'm、uh, sorry, consumers are more sensitive to your price than、uh, to the retail price. What you may do is to decrease your price a little bit. Anyway, that's something we will always try to do when we have an analytical solution. Let's continue. In equilibrium, the wholesale price will be this one. So the retail price will also will will be this one, as we can calculate. The qualitative impact of A, B, and C on the retail price is actually the same. For that about the wholesale price, right? Because the formula looks very similar. The sales volume will become A minus B C over four. Okay, here, when A goes up. Demand will、uh, sorry the sales volume will go up, because the consumers like this product more. But if the cost goes up or the price sensitivity goes up, then less consumer will buy this product. Eventually, the retailers earn something, the manufacturer earns something, and all together we can get this. It's just that a minus b c is a constant there. Oh、uh, sorry, a minus b c square over b is a constant there. But this three over sixteen should not be um should not be weird to you, because you have observed that when we have the illustrative case. The last thing is to compare that, compare the equilibrium outcome with a cooperative supply chain or integrated supply chain. Suppose the two companies can integrate or can collaborate to set the price. Okay, let's see. What should they do? There is at least one way, or one proposal that can make them better. Let's say the wholesale price is C, and the retail price is one half. Suppose they do this. Suppose they choose a wholesale price as C, and the retail price as one half. Now here we are assuming that the parameters are one, one, and zero. In this case, the sales volume. Will be one half, 
and the total profit will be one fourth. Uh, if you remind yourself about the pricing problem we discussed in our first lecture, this is actually what a single firm will do. Okay, this is actually what a monopolist will do. So, the monopolist or the co or uh, or the integrated two firms should actually do this. So we call this first best. Okay, this is the best thing they may do. If there is a first best, then of course there will be second best. Okay, we will talk about that in the future. But here, keep in mind, this is actually what a single firm or the two firms cooperated two firms will do. And more importantly, this number is greater than three over sixteen, right? So again, decentralization creates some kind of inefficiency in this channel or in this supply chain. When the two firms do not cooperate, they earn less. Okay, they earn less. They are making inefficient decisions. That's the result. Now, let's discuss how may we split 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 the pie to get a win-win situation. If we have one force all together, but previously the manufacturer can earn. 1 over 8, and the manufacturer can earn 1 over 16. Then, the very, the very easy thing to split this 1 over 4 is that I first give 1 over 8 to the manufacturer, and then I give 1 over 16 to the retailer, and then I still have 1 over 16 remain. I can split that maybe equally to both of them, or to use whatever method to, make, to give both of them. It's very easy to find a way to coordinate these two companies and then split the pie to result in the win-win situation. Okay? At the end, I would like to invite you to think about a question. Previously, when we talk about the corner competition, we say it's inefficient, but consumers like it. Okay? Consumers prefer the firms to be decentralized. Please think about whether consumers prefer a decentralized system in this pricing and supply chain problem. Okay? It depends on whether consumers can buy cheaper products. That's something the consumers care about. Okay? Teach yourself or think about it by yourself. If you are a consumer, do you prefer the supply chain to be coordinated or decentralized? Think about it. Let's discuss it in class. Okay, that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you.